In the southwest Pacific, 500 miles from the Philippines, are the Palau's, westernmost of the Japanese-mandated islands. On a tiny one called Peleliu, the Japs have a good airstrip. We must seize it to protect our invasion of the Philippines. It will also help us cut off a great chain of enemy strongholds loaded with troops. We begin by softening it up, bombing, strafing. Navy planes from fast carrier forces strike first. 3,000 sorties are flown, dropping over two and a half million pounds of bombs. of the Far Eastern Air Force fly 400 sorties to add another two million pounds. When the two air arms have completed their strikes, the Jap air strength in the Palau's is crossed out. The stage is now set, and from their bases, Guadalcanal, Pearl Harbor, the Marshals, come the assault forces. Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, transports, over 600 ships of all types. It requires three Navy men afloat to put one soldier or Marine ashore. Marine Division is in those transports over there. They'll take Peleliu. And in these is the 81st Army Division. They'll take Angar six miles south, which also must be held before Peleliu is secure. D minus one. Those who can have a bath. All have a good meal. stations. Close all watertight doors and hatches. And the assault force is buttoned up, ready for action. There's the signal. 30 seconds to go. Turrets are loaded with 2,000 pound projectiles, 200 pounds of powder. Three hundred heavy guns train on the target. Ready? Commence firing. During three days and nights, the Navy will pour 6,000 tons of hot steel on the island. Take those small guns, the 40 millimeters. They alone will fire 100,000 shells. The big guns, 70,000. 12 million pounds of punishment. The enemy is well dug in over there, holed up in strong pillboxes and deep caves. This will kill a lot of them, soften up their defenses. But the Marines will have the bulk of the Jap strength left to face when they get ashore.
H hour for the Marines. Three regiments will land abreast on a 2,000 yard beach. The first and fifth will pivot left and head toward Bloody Nose Ridge. The seventh will pivot right to secure that flank. The airstrip is straight ahead. Jap mortar and artillery fire is heavy. The first wave is pinned down. Twenty landing vehicles are knocked out, but we're on the beach. Strafing Jap positions. Casualties the first day. 92 killed. 1,100 wounded. 58 missing. Veterans, these Marines. Guadalcanal, New Britain. This is their third show. Well trained, well equipped. Expert with rifles, grenades, flamethrowers, mortars, artillery. 15 million rifle and machine gun bullets, 90,000 mortar shells, 150,000 field artillery shells, and 125,000 hand grenades will be presented by the Marine Corps to Imperial Japan with the compliments of hometown USA. is heavily entrenched in a honeycomb of caves and fortified positions. That's where he'll make his final stand. few hours. Some will remain forever.
Cedar Island, six miles away, soldiers of the 81st Army Division are landing. This is their first engagement. Like the Marines, their combat strength is around 15,000 men. Reinforcements and supply echelons double that figure. It required 20 transports to bring the 81st to this beach. Again, the pattern of war in the Pacific. Landing craft, tanks, assault waves driving in to establish a beachhead. from China and Manchuria campaigns. 16 days will be required for the 81st to take Angar. Back at Peleliu, the Japs attempted to bring up reinforcements during the night. They were repulsed, but a few concealed themselves on these sunken boats. Snipers. flying one of the shortest bomber missions on record. From the airstrip, the bloody nose. A thousand yards. Inland, the Marines are struggling yard by yard for bloody nose ridge. It's made to order for the Jap system of defense. Ridges, sharp peaks, vertical cliffs, deeply gutted depressions, all held in a crossfire from caves and pillboxes.
casualties are mounting now, even among the combat cameramen. Nine fell taking these pictures. Elements of the 81st Army Division, tanks, infantry, come over from Angar to help out. There's a Jap. It's over. More than 300 prisoners. From a tree-covered stronghold, Bloody Nose Ridge has been reduced to a scarred heap of rubble strewn with Jap dead. Over 10,000 of them. And we have what we came after, the airstrip. But we have something more. By typical operations like this and Iwo Jima, we have cut off a quarter of a million Jap troops in the islands of the Pacific. And this fighting must go on without pause until the Pacific War is won.
Note the tapering edges of the wings, the rounded tip. See how straight the line is from engine to tail. And that tail, see how the leading edge of the vertical piece tapers more than the trailing edge. Look how it curves out to a point away. Think you can recognize her? Don't think. Be sure. Watch her. Watch her closely. Yes, we know. That's no zero. That's a P-40. But did you know? They don't look alike to you now, do they? Look at the difference in the shape of those noses. The P-40, with its deep radiator, is oval. The zero is a perfect circle, broken only by that oil cooler. Get those undercarriage fairings on the P-40. Compare the tail. The tail of the P-40 is high. The tail of the Zero is middle. Let's look at her from below. Look at the pointed nose of the P-40 and the blunt nose of the Zero. The leading edge of the wings of the P-40 has no taper. The wings of the Zero taper back. The tail of the P-40 is not. The tail of the Zero tapers into the fuselage, which extends beyond it. Now, let's take them in profile. The engine of the P-40 is in line. The Zero is radial. Note the deep radiator on the P-40 as compared to the shallow oil cooler and air scoop on the Zero. Next, see how the cockpit the canopy on the P-40 is much further back from the nose than on the Zero. What's more, the canopy on the P-40 fits into the fuselage, while the canopy on the Zero sits on the fuselage. Now for the tail. The p 40 is rounded and curves in toward the nose. The Zero's is pointed and curves out away from the nose. No one could possibly mistake them for each other, could they? You think not? Well, let's see. Let's take the case of one pilot. His name was Jimmy Saunders. His story starts on the day when he was flying to a base somewhere in the Far East. Something I didn't know about, did it? Huh? Oh, yes. The wingtips can be 
slow to utilize more space in the carrier. Incidentally, the fan is 39 feet 4 inches. All right, go on with the engine. Engine, radio, Mitsubishi version of our cyclone. That's right. There are twin row 14 cylinders. Now for the fuselage. Fuselage. Blunt nose with a spinner on it. Cockpit canopy sits on the fuselage. Retractable landing gear with fairing plates. Hey, uh, there seems to be one gear missing, sir. The gears are operated hydraulically. As a result, the wheels retract elegantly. I guess there are a couple of things I don't know about this airplane, sir. I'm glad to hear you admit it. That's the beginning of wisdom. The lanes in the fuselage are in one piece, made of pure aluminum. Uh, there's another feature worth noting. The entire fuselage is flush riveted. With the result, there are very few protuberances to cause wind resistance. The length is 28 feet, 5 inches. There's a pair of machine guns mounted in grooves above the cowling. They're 7.7 millimeters, and they're synchronized to fire through the propeller. I hope you don't ever get them on your tail. I'm with you there, sir. <laughs> All right, finish it up. Tail. Leading edge of flat surface tapers more than trailing edge, with the fuselage extending to a point beyond it. Leading edge of vertical piece tapers more than trailing edge. Tail is pointed, curves out away from the nose. I guess that's it, sir. Good enough. As you probably know, there are three types of zeros. One is a single float plane without rigging. All three have slightly varying characteristics. But this is the type you're most apt to tangle with, so get to know it. All of them. Yes, sir. I'll look for the balls of rouge on their wings and fuselage. Yeah, I wouldn't depend on that if I were you. The Japs have a neat trick of painting all sorts of colors. Sometimes even like our P-40s. Coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Well, sir, how soon do I get a chance to knock one up and down? Soon enough. But don't get any idea if the zero is a pushover. With 340 miles an hour top speed, the service sitting at 35,500 feet in a normal range of 700 miles, increased by a droppable extra fuel tank, there's not much you can't do. They built a lay maneuverable, threw away the armor protection for the pilot and the self-sealing gasoline tank. Fuel away around just a few hundred pounds, fully loaded has a horsepower of over 900. And when you see the speed with which he climbs, you'll appreciate what I'm saying. There's just no use trying to dogfight a zero. That's out. The best bet is to hit fast. Either the wings or just behind the cockpit. But if you miss, don't hang around. Really, you said it's all that, sir? Seems believing. If I were you, I'd take my word for it. Yes, sir. Now, here's our operation. When you're on your own, you'll do patrol from our base here to these outlying islands.
Are you sure it's a C-45? I'm positive, sir. After he held fire, he drew up and dipped his wings in recognition. I don't like to complain, sir, but do we have to fight our own Air Force too? You've got good cause for complaint. I don't know who's responsible for this, but what I do... Come in. Major, I want you... I'm sorry, sir. Lieutenant Sean is reporting, sir. I just want Lieutenant? To... Well, and here has been telling me that he was attacked this afternoon by one of our planes. Do you, by any chance, know anything about this? Yes, sir. I'm afraid it was me. He's afraid. Well, Saunders, what have you got to say for yourself? Not much, sir. From a distance, I was sure it was a zero. Then I held my fire. A little because... late on your identification, weren't you? Yes, sir. But I did run. How far were you from the other plane when you opened fire? I'm not quite sure, sir. We'll soon find out. Have your film developed immediately. Yes, sir. Major, I want you to wait, Lieutenant. Get after that film. Yes, sir. Start firing at that distance. Hold it. Didn't you look in your sight? I thought I did, sir. You don't seem to be very sure of yourself, Lieutenant. I'm sure of one thing, Major. That's right. Look at that airplane. It's closer now, I realize. But even at the distance you started firing, you should have been able to identify it. Look at that deep radiator. The inline engine. That cockpit canopy fits into the fuselage. The tail is round and curved in toward the nose. All right, Corporal, take it away. There's more film, sir. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but I have an appointment. You can stay and run it if you want to. Coming, Weldon. Well, if you don't mind, sir, I think I'll stay for a few more feet. I want to see how close I came to being wiped out. Carry on, Corporal. Now I know what a clay pigeon feels like. Hey, wait a minute. That's not me. It's a zero. What? Well, Saunders, I think I'll forego that appointment. Let's hear about this. Well, sir, following my encounter with the lieutenant here, I was flying along wondering if I should slip my throat. I felt like a candidate for the Jap Air Force, getting time to turn for home. Not that I was homesick. I had a hunch what was in store for me. Well, there was no use stalling. I was thinking that other guy's probably back already, telling the major how he almost got knocked down by another P-40. Thinking what you'd tell me when I got back. Suddenly I stopped thinking. I saw something. Another plane. I tried to make her out. She was too far away. I started to cry. I had to get my recognition up this time. Cigar shaped fuselage, tapering to point and rear. Check. Wings close to nose.
I don't think, however, that you have anything to worry about in the future. At least not from Saunders. He seems to have learned his lesson. By a method I'd hardly recommend putting into general practice, but nevertheless, he's learned it thoroughly. If every pilot would only realize the importance of identification and become letter perfect in the art of identification, and can cure lives lost and cure planes destroyed. Know your enemy, but also know your friends. Well, they know their friends, all right. And what's more, they know their enemy. Do you? Radio engine. Perfect circle, broken only by oil coolers. Low wings. Cockpit canopy sits on cigar-shaped fuselage.
British allies were hurling their naval might at the bypassed fortress of Pomona. They were raking Sakashima with shell and bomb. England's greatest battleships and newest carriers were there, screening us on the south, paying off with pleasure an old debt to Nippon. On the northern flank, Admiral Mark A. Mitcher's tireless Task Force 58 stepped up its two weeks old aerial assault on Kyushu and the enemy home island.
struggle between men who want to die and men who fight to live. ships were there, and new ships of the line. And a rugged little man named Ernie Pyle. There was no retreat. This was the fleet that came to stay, that had to stay. stay because the men that the Navy landed needed tons of steel from Navy guns. Even as we beat off fresh waves of Jap planes overhead, the big guns of the fleet smashed enemy strongholds miles away. Had to stay because our men advancing through the rice paddies and over the steep ridges had to have close air support from the baby flat tops. In the air control room aboard the command ship, strike upon strike was ordered. Then the Navy and Marine flyers laid down precise, deadly rocket fire to help make the next 50 yards of advance less possible. This was the fleet that had to stay because always the stream of supplies to those troops must be steady and huge. A bridge of ships was thrown across the Pacific to bring our men more food, more medicine, more ammunition. And waiting at the end of the longest supply route in any war were the kamikaze. It was weird. It was savage. This was a fleet, fighting like infantry, punching away at the enemy. Only, there are no foxholes in the ocean. March 18th to the 
21st, 556 Japanese planes destroyed. fought without sleep. Some fought with guns. Some with axes, torches. Some with fire smothering foam. It was fix and fight at the same time. at their battle stations, and some were buried. attacks, weary men afloat and ashore paid honor to the beloved figure in the blue navy cloak, said farewell to the father of the modern American Navy. Then they turned and met the next assault. During three fabulous months, thousands of aircraft were hurled against our ships. But only 10% ever slipped through our air patrol. Yet the siege by air went on. The Japanese beast still spat zero. April 6, 277, enemy planes shot down. April 12, 100 planes. May 3rd, 97. watch on May 9th, the great news came. VE Day in Europe. It came first to the lookouts, to the men who stand guard while the others sleep. Men were glad and grateful. Home seemed a little nearer. But for now, VE Day was simply the 1,247th day of our Pacific War. From the rolling decks of our carriers, the fighters rose once again to intercept the enemy. and destroyers and battleships. Our heavy batteries once more leveled against the Jap-studded hills of Okinawa. The barking 20s and 40s sent streams of fiery lead into the world's last alien sky. May 12th, 164 Jap aircraft down. June 3rd, 45. June 6th, 67. June 8th, 30. Japanese 
Americans paid with their Air Force, with their newest ships, 4,232 planes. The fleet that came to stay paid a price too. But our men, our ships, our planes, took everything the land could throw at the sea and handed it back double. The question, could a fleet stand up against the massed fury of land-based planes, got an emphatic answer from the men who fight to live, from the fleet that came to stay.